Hello, everybody, and welcome into my latest live broadcast. It's Friday, the 12th of April, 2024. My name is Kerry Holzman. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and joining me today as we have a review for you on a new mini form, mini PC. That is an unbelievable value. And uh, well, I'll tell you what, you can decide it for yourself as we talk about that today, kind of go over it and uh, give you an idea of what you can expect if you want to buy one. Uh, hello, and thank you to all the members joining us and all our regulars, our friends in green and blue in white there in the chat room. Thank you for hanging out with me today. Hope you're having a great Friday so far. And into the chat room here very quickly, I, uh, a thank you to our supporters, uh, Mortant, <coughs> as well as Dwayne Blackwelder, Luke Greenia, renewing their membership. Uh, Dwayne said he looks like he's going to be able to make today's live stream. Right on. We're glad to have you here, Dwayne. Luke Greenia, been a member now for 23 months. Wow. Has membership been on for almost two years? Holy cow. He says, hello, everyone from Vermont. Hey, Luke, thank you for continuing your support here. 3D Everything, also a member for 23 months, says hello. And Alan Lindus with a $17.77 contribution said, I've missed a few podcasts, so I will double my fee. Craig Casabona with a very generous $20 Super Chat contribution. Ben Lard joins us from Scotland and contributes two pounds. And Chris Johnson, another member, renewing now for their 23rd month. That is so awesome. Uh, guys, this channel would be a fraction of itself currently without your support. So I can't thank those of you who are members enough for making this channel uh, continue to be able to produce as much content as I want to make. Speaking of which, Mark Gaines, also a member for 23 months. Mark joins us from Northern Ireland. He says, hello, Carrie, Marlena, DG, and everyone in the chat. Welcome in, welcome in, and thank you again. <clears throat> now, this week has been a, a pretty busy week on the other side of things, obviously. That's, uh, if you're not seeing videos from me during the week, um, it's because something of a higher priority is taking place. And so that's been quite stressful the last couple of weeks and trying to work through it. It's uh, maybe resolved. I'm not sure. But in the meantime, uh, I, I, there is no shortage of content for me to make. There's a shortage of time for me to make them in. So hopefully I can get to making uh, more frequent videos next week or very soon, as soon as I can. Uh, I've got a lot of catching up to do. And uh, thank you again for making it possible. Nick Caffrey with a five euro contribution says, I'm happy to be here. Hello to Carrie, Mara, and Chat. Welcome in, Nick. Thank you. And uh, Barry Klein uh, renews membership also 23 months. He says, Today is my anniversary as well. That is so awesome. So many of you that are members for 23 months. I'm sure we didn't have membership 24 months ago. So you guys must be part of the original gang that supported me right on day one. And I can't thank you enough for that because this channel would be a fraction of what it is today. It'd still be around. It just wouldn't be as active as it is without your support. So we're, we're here for you. We, we're for the community and by the community. And for those of you watching the content for the first time, it's because of these folks and everybody in blue and green in our chat room that make this all possible. Also, our friends at Minis Forum who sent us a number of PCs over the years to review. They don't have any formal contract with us. It's basically a gentleman's agreement. They send the unit at no cost and I review it uh, in an honest way and that's it, that's the deal. And uh, a lot of companies don't wanna do that. A lot of companies, they want a commercial and they wanna be assured that you're gonna be selling their product. Otherwise, you know, why would they bother? So you know you're dealing with a company that really believes in their product when they have the confidence to say, yeah, We'll send it to you, you review it, say whatever you want. That tells you a lot about what the company feels about their own product. I think that right there is an admirable and noble quality that says a lot, a lot more than any commercial or advertising could ever say that meant anything. So today we're looking at the Minis Forum NAB 9. <clears throat> now, if we look at the website for this product here, let me, let me go over to the Minis Forum website. And we have a link to this in the video notes below the video. Um,
guess my glasses don't really help when I'm trying to see that far away. Uh, let's see. We want the window capture. There it is. Okay. So <clears throat> you'll see this page covers three different models, the NAB7, NAB6, and NAB9. And the difference between them is how they're going to be spec'd out with which CPU they've got, right? So looking here as an i9-12900K, this is the NAB9. If we click over here, you'll see the i7-12650H, which is the NAB6. On the outside, they look pretty similar, but it's the inside that makes all the difference. They do share the same housing. Now, if you look here, they, uh, unlike other mini PC manufacturers, you can buy this in a bare bone format, meaning you can go and get your own RAM as much as you want to get, as fast as you want to get it, uh, in your own storage, as much as you want to get, as fast as you want to get it, and put your own operating system on here. So you don't have to buy this with some factory default RAM and storage that for some of you isn't good enough for you, which is just wasting your money if you're just gonna turn around and take that stuff right out. For most people, they'll be very happy with just a regular configuration of 32 gigs of RAM and a 512 gig or one terabyte SSD. And of course the price will change up here accordingly based on how you configure it. Do you save money if you do it yourself? Yeah, not really. You kind of spend more if you do it yourself because you'll be buying, in most cases, if, if the reason you're getting bare bone is to save money, that would imply you either already have the RAM and storage laying around or that the stock RAM and storage isn't good enough for you. I can guarantee you they're buying the RAM and the storage much cheaper than you can, but they're also not buying the high end. So you will save money getting it pre-configured versus doing it yourself. But when you do it yourself, you have more control over how much RAM, what speed, how much storage, what speed. But you pay for that. Now, if we scroll down and look at the specifications, you'll see there's the NAB9 specs here, the NAB7, the NAB6, and the FAQ. I think a lot of people miss these tabs. They don't really stand out to me. So I just want to point out that they're there so you're looking at the right product. Now you'll see they advertise this as a Core i9-12900HK processor. That's 14 cores and 20 threads. That's insane. Uh, it's got the built-in Intel graphics built into the GPU, uh, built into the CPU. We have an integrated GPU. Um, this is clearly not going to be ideal for high-end gaming machines. This is really for literally anything but that. Um, DDR4 RAM, not DDR5, it's DDR4. And of course, uh, a regular uh, M.2 NVMe, that's PCI Gen 4. Now, there is the option to add a two and a half inch solid state drive, or I guess you could add a mechanical drive if you wanted to, to the bottom of the lid. I don't recommend doing that to any mini PC because it just adds more heat to the box. I think if you need more storage, get a NAS, get an external USB drive, use cloud storage. I mean, depending on how much storage you need and what your budget is, I would avoid adding more heat inside of any mini PC. <clears throat> We've got uh, two HDMI ports as well as two USB uh, C type ports that will both support two monitors at 4K at 60 Hertz. That means you can have four monitors running simultaneously on this. Um, Our audio output is gonna go through HDMI or and or through the combination jack on the front of the machine, which is for a microphone uh, or headphones or a headset that has both a microphone and headphones on it. We've got 2.5 gig ethernet and we've got two of those as well as a USB. Oh, these are USB 3.2. I might've mistakenly said USB 4. These are USB 3.2. There's a Gen 1 Type-C, that's a data-only port in the front. There's a Type-C uh, USB 3.2, that's display port output only, that's to power a monitor. And of course, you can get an adapter to switch that to HDMI if your monitor doesn't support display port. And then there's a Type-C port that has uh, display port and data and power delivery output, meaning if you had a low power 
monitor, you could power a portable monitor through this PC using just one cable to provide both the display and the power. And I've demonstrated that with other units before. It's pretty cool tech. Uh, it's more portable, I would say, than anything that somebody would necessarily set up as their desktop. But you could if you wanted to. Of course, it's got Windows 11 on it, and Miniswarm is only shipping computers with Windows 11 Home. You don't need to ask. It's always going to be Windows 11 Home. Uh, unless things change, every computer they sell at any price point, if it comes with an operating system, it comes with Windows 11 Home. I don't think most people would know the difference between Home and Pro. You don't really get anything more that most people need. So I think Home is fine. Um, I can't say that I have a single client that needs Windows 11 Pro. Everything we do would work equally well on Home or Pro. Well, we're not using BitLocker. We're not using a remote desktop. And we're not signing into a domain server so outside, or using uh, Hyper-V for virtual machines. So outside of those four reasons, uh, unless you're doing one of those four things, maybe you could use Windows 11 Pro, but I think it's mostly a psychological issue where people feel like they're missing out if they don't have Pro. And it's, you know, kudos to Microsoft marketing for manipulating people's mindsets to that level that it's uncommon for me to run into anybody who who thinks that Windows 11 Pro is the same as Windows 11 Home. They see Windows 11 Home almost universally, and rarely do I ever encounter anybody who sees Windows 11 Pro as nothing more than a discounted, disabled version of Windows 11 Pro, which is not what it is. They're essentially the exact same operating system, and the difference is, is for most home users, is purely psychological. But, you know, that's fine. It's not hurting anybody. If you want to put Pro on it, you can at your expense. I just think it's a waste of time and money for most people. But you do you. Um, terrible salesman, aren't I? Um, fact of the matter is, Windows 11 Home and Windows 11 Pro will meet the needs of 98% of home users, period. Um, the 2%, the, the they, they already know they need Pro. We don't need to have this discussion. They already have this information. Sometimes people say, oh, I want to get Windows 11 Pro. I want to upgrade. And I go, well, what do you need it to do that Windows 11 Home isn't doing? And they usually say, well, just isn't it better? No, not unless you need one of those four things. It's the exact same thing. And a lot of times they do it anyway. It's such a psychological grip on their mind. They simply can't let it go unless they have it. I find that psychology personally fascinating, but... Uh, Again, it's your money, it's your time. I just want to give you the information. And with that information, you can make an informed decision. That's right for you. All right, so looking at the unit, this looks very similar to other Minis Forum units we've looked at before. So we've, we're familiar with this enclosure or with this case. However, the components, that's what we're really looking at here, including their new cooling design, which keeps the machine running, not only cool, but quietly. And uh, there's a little fan on the included NVMe drive as well. So if you're going to replace the NVMe, be sure and uh, take this heatsink off and put it onto your new one. When we get into Gen 4, anything above Gen 3, we do have some concerns about heat, especially in an enclosed space. So uh, having a fan on there certainly can't hurt anything. Okay, so again, I've got the link in the video notes below. And if I can scroll this back up, feel free to click on that link and read through any of the details that I might have gone over too quickly. And of course, if you have questions about the unit, go ahead and put them in the chat. But let me go back right now over to camera one and uh, let's open up the box. Now, I will tell you that unlike in previous live broadcasts where we've waited for updates forever, I've gone ahead and taken this out of the box and did all the updates on it. Now, we did have Windows 23H2. Um, it did not require me, I don't think it required me to um, run the bypass NRO uh, to get past the Microsoft account requirement. As I recall, that was already done, but it's otherwise, it's a nice, clean, 
bloat free version of Windows 11 Home, just the same as you would install. Uh, and feel free to reinstall it if you don't trust manufacturers installs. No harm in that either. You can essentially do that for free, downloading your Windows 11 image from Microsoft. We've got videos covering all that if you've missed out on those. Now, in the box, we've got our manual and just a little warning here that tells us that uh, they're not recommending you take the CPU cooler off. They're using a liquid metal and it's an application method that requires an, an amount of precision that you will not be able to put back as good as it is right now. So by taking the cooler off, you're only going to be harming the cooling. You will not be making, making it any better. If you don't believe me and you buy it and, and you want to try it, you were warned. All right. So I don't know what else to say on that. So they're, they're not telling you this because there's something they don't want you to see. They're telling you this because there's a very special application method on the liquid metal cooling they're using that basically requires a machine to do it. So uh, just so you know what you're getting yourself into. All right, Mark Leonosio with a renewal of, of uh, membership, now a member for 23 months as well. Right on. Thank you, Mark. Ken says, if you order the bare bone, does it come with the cooling fan? No, of course not. No, 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 no. If you see an NVMe drive with a cooling fan and you don't order the NVMe drive, you don't get the heat sink and cooling fan that goes on that NVMe drive. No. You can buy one. Um, I shouldn't talk so confidently. I'm pretty sure, pretty sure that comes with the NVMe drive. A, a fair question, but I would just make the assumption that that's a, it's like saying if I, if I buy the car, I, I don't know. I can't even think of a good analogy for this. It's, it's something that comes with the NVMe drive, generally speaking. So if you don't get the NVMe drive, you don't get what comes with it, like the operating system. All right. So let's open up the box and let's see. Um, in the box, we've got a power adapter, which is pretty small, actually. We've got an HDMI cable. We've got a small SATA adapter. If you wanted to install a two and a half inch drive, you would need to use this to cable it. We've got a Visa bracket mount. If you wanted to mount this computer on the back of your monitor and hide it, though it would make getting to any of the ports difficult. We have screws here that are for a two and a half inch drive install. And then of course we've got a Cloverleaf or Mickey Mouse style laptop sort of power adapter or power cable um, that plugs into this and then this plugs into the wall. Now me personally, my preference, I'd much rather have something that plugs into a cable than a big brick that plugs directly into the outlet because it tends to block other things around it. Uh, to me, this is much more convenient to be able to have a separate power cable. Now, obviously, you could buy an extension cable, right, and plug it into a <clears throat> one of those direct uh, wall wart plugs. It's nice when everything you need is in the box. It's my preference anyway. Okay, so in the box, what's great about these uh, this particular design, if you recall, we've looked at others similar for Minis Forum. No tools are required to open it up. On the top of the unit, you'll see there's, there's a little diagram with fingers pointing down. And what they're telling you is if you put your fingers there and you push, you can get right in there. Now, this may not be ideal if you have children, curious children, young children poking around. But uh, for those of us uh, that are uh, in a situation where we can make sure that that's not a problem, that is very handy. You'll see our RAM modules in there from uh, ADATA. You'll see our Wi-Fi card. You'll see our NVMe drive and that white plug just over the Wi-Fi card. That's where you're going to plug in your two and a half inch drive, which if you wanted to, goes right in the top of the lid right there. Now, again, adding more heat in here is not a good idea, in my opinion, because there's really no fan in this side. All the fans 
or on this side. I should also mention, while we have a plastic top and a plastic bottom, I believe this is an aluminum body with the Kensington lock right there. So if you were afraid of somebody stealing it, like in an office or in a public place, you can lock it down to prevent it from walking, you know, growing legs and walking away. You'll see we've got our two type A USB ports here. These are two, doesn't give us the number. Sometimes you'll see a number up here, five or 10. <clears throat> uh, right now, I'm not sure what speed those are. Those will be USB three, not sure what version. We'll have to look that up. And then we've got our HDMI and USB type C with a little picture of a monitor that tells you that's gonna support display out. Our two, two and a half gig ethernet ports our HDMI port over here, and yet another USB-C. This one tells you power delivery. There's a picture of a monitor. This is a full USB port. And then we use a barrel style power plug right there. Nothing on the sides, just ventilation, as you can see across the bottom. And then on the front, as described, we've got a, uh, a BIOS reset tool here, a power button. There's our audio output, two more USB type A's. This is our, I believe, data only USB-C. So that would be like for a uh, flash drive or something like that. And then we've got a little microphone right there, little dynamic microphone. So it's a heck of a package and it's really well equipped. When you consider what's been going on with CPUs lately, we've been kind of stagnant for a while, in my opinion. Whether we go back to 9th gen, 10th gen, 11th gen, 12th gen, 13th gen, 14th gen, we're not seeing massive leaps and bounds between generations. So yes, if you skip three or four, if you go from 9th gen to 13th gen, minimally, you'll say, oh, I see a difference. But 9th to 10th or 10th to 12th, uh, you know, kind of the same. So the 12900 was Intel's flagship on their 12th gen. And... Uh, it was, you know, a $500, $600 chip when it came out. But then the 13900 came out shortly thereafter. And then that means that the high-end chip is no longer the high-end chip. The 12900, which was formerly King of the Hill, is now one step down. And then shortly thereafter, the 14900 came out, which then moved the 13900 down in both the concept of performance and price becomes less desirable for people who only want the latest and greatest which means the 12th gen. By the way, all of these, we're living in such a weird time. If you wanted to build a desktop computer today, you could go on Amazon or Newegg and buy a 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, or 14th gen Intel chip. They're still available brand new for sale. Of course, the older the generation, the cheaper the chip is, it's depreciated, even though it's still brand new in a box. You're getting the exact same product. So. Because there's not a huge difference between a 12900 and a 13900 and a 14900, the value proposition on the 12900 is much better, much better than that you're getting far more performance for your dollar. And as such, Minisform can offer this at a very aggressive price point, which is just two years ago, three years ago, two years ago, probably would have easily been double this price. So. If you always want the latest and greatest, just so you can get another 15% more speed out of it, you're going to pay a lot more than 15% more. That's all I'm saying. The value goes away. So if you're looking for something that, you know, you're not entering budget level, entry level budget machine, you need something more powerful than that, then buy yesterday's flagship, which is essentially what this is. So let's plug it in. See how it performs in reality. As I mentioned, I've updated it and done all the basic things I do in it, just to make sure that the video can just keep moving along and that we don't stagnate for too long, stalling, waiting for things. Now I've said that and you know, who knows, maybe there's an update waiting, but it shouldn't be too bad. I think it should be good to go. So there's our power. We'll go ahead and plug in our ethernet. We'll plug into any of the HDMI ports, doesn't matter which one you plug into. And then we need a keyboard and a mouse, which I have right here, ready and prepared today. And uh, let's plug that in. 
So part of my, I'm not used to having a lid that you can push down uh, to open, to release it. So I have a bad habit of putting my weight on the top of these. Um, obviously, if I owned one and worked with it every day, the only time I'd really need to touch it is plugging things in. And so I would have a bad habit of, say, I want to plug in a USB flash drive. My habit is to grab it on top, you know, to secure it while I'm plugging the drive in. And by doing that, when I push down, the lid pops up. But, it, you know, that just means I need to be more aware <laughs> of that feature on this machine. Or, or if I were to use a machine like this on a daily basis, I'd have to create new habits. Right? So be aware, be aware of that. Um, sort of the, the, the pro and the con of having a, a lid that can come up like that without tools is it may come up unexpectedly when you're not thinking about it. But it doesn't hurt anything. It's just... Uh, it surprises me every time I don't expect it. So let's go over to um, our HDMI input here. And let me put myself in a corner. See if I can do this. Might be a little rusty here. And then let's go ahead and turn it on. And let's see what our actual boot time is on this. As we are live and unscripted, this is all filmed in one take. Everything you see happens in actual real time. So remember that when this is plugged in, and we shut it off, there's always a little bit of power running through it. So it'll probably boot up faster when it's in a normal position of daily use. However, when you take it out of the box and it's been unplugged for power for a while, it might take just a couple seconds longer to boot. It might not. It just kind of depends on how long it's been off. But there we go. We're already booted up. And as you can see, I've added a bunch of things to the desktop that are very common things I add to the desktop if you've ever seen me reviewing PCs before. It's all the same freeware portable software that I use for basic measurements. Now, when we talk about the NVMe drive that's included being a Gen 4, bear in mind that this is going to be a budget Gen 4 drive. This is not going to be a high-end drive, or they would have to charge you more for the machine. And that might be something you'd want, but not something the general public. The general public wants as much as they can get for as little as possible. And so it's always a challenge for a manufacturer to uh, find the balancing act there. So here you'll see we're much faster than Gen 3. We've got 4,800 megabytes per second on our reads, 3,890, so 3,900 on our writes. Uh, it's respectable. It keeps the heat down, and it's nothing to shake a stick at. You're not going to see a whole lot of difference between 4,000 megabytes a second and 40,000 megabytes per second on your storage because most of you aren't really moving that much data. And if you are, you're not doing it very often. And you're going to be bottlenecked by your internet speed regardless. So at some point, you reach a, you reach a point of diminishing returns where you, or you're just chasing after benchmark numbers that in reality make... Uh, a very insignificant difference in the operation and boot time and uh, performance of the machine. It's all mostly a psychological game. Some people do need to have the extra milliseconds. Some people, but most people would never notice it. So those people who need that, they obviously pay a lot more money. So you, you have to have reasonable expectations about what you're getting. And instead of looking at like, well, at 4,900 megabytes per second, I know I can buy a Gen 4 drive that runs 7,300 megabytes per second. Yeah, and it's going to cost you a third of the price of the whole computer, right? So if you want that, you can do that. You can spend that extra money for that excess. But then if you actually had a stopwatch or you had somebody who didn't know computers, just time you. Because I think most people, are they're, they're too connected. They're too close to see it. The, just have a friend or a family member who has nothing to do with computers. Time how long it takes the computer to open, how long it takes for you to check your email or get online, how long it takes for you to do whatever it is you use your computer for with the faster drive and with a slower drive. Do everything else the same. And I think the person you ask to measure that is going to say, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. They're both the same. So we see what we want to see, I suppose. And if we want to pay for that, Optionally, you can, but I'll tell you what, this is a great value for everything you're getting. 
and this was a flagship processor just two years ago. Has it even been two years? So the processors haven't really done much in the last two years as far as evolving and getting better. Now, the next generation of processors, which we use uh, chiplets instead of these big monolithic processors, that's going to be a significant difference. Will it be better or worse? I don't know. We'll see. But the 14th gen is just a 13th gen, which is really just a 12th, which is really, <laughs> they're all just kind of built on the same platform. So the 12th, 13th, and 14th are all basically the same process node that's just been spit shined from one generation to the next. That's not really introducing any, any new evolution there other than just refining what they already have or polishing it. And people eat that up. People love it. They go, oh, this is the same thing as last year, only now it's shinier. All right, so I'll pay $200 more for it. Um, be a smarter consumer. Buy last year's model or the model from two years ago that's brand new, not used, and save a lot of money. You get a lot more bang for your buck, in my opinion. Something to think about. <clears throat> All right, I'm just looking through the chat here to see what I'm missing. Gregory Howard contributes $20 in Super Chat. He says, uh, my brother passed away at age 72 a few days ago. Oh, I'm so sorry. I... Um, I, I kind of get speechless when I hear, you know, sadness like this because I'm not quite sure how to make anybody feel better about it other than, you know, I'm really sorry that you had to suffer that loss. And, uh, and I appreciate you letting us know. And of course, we're here, you know, that's, we're a big community here. And of course, uh, it, know that if you're ever uh, looking for friends, someone to talk to, our community is very special in that way, and and uh, we hope you're doing okay. And thank you for your contribution, Ben. Mark Leonosio says hello from Las Vegas. Okay. Now, I don't know how well you can tell, but this thing is dead silent. I don't hear a fan in any respect. Now, of course, if we start really pushing this machine hard, I expect the fan will become audible, but at no point does it ever get, in my opinion, it never gets loud, like distracting, where I have to leave the room to talk on the phone or something like that but you'll definitely know it's on, right? When you're really making it work, something that's really resource intensive. I'm trying to see what we can do here to, what do we have we can run? Um, but Cinebench, Cinebench will make it run and that'll test the heat out on it. Let's go ahead and do that. That'll be some torture. And then we can bring up, uh, let's see, set the license agreement. Let me minimize this for a second and bring up um, HWI. Yeah, let's try that. Just the sensors is all I need. <clears throat> It's censorship. All right. Let's take a look at... our CPU temperatures here, which should be... right here. Now, you can see our temps right now probably rival that of whatever computer you're using right now, a desktop or a laptop, may not even be running this cool. That's how good this cooling system is. But what happens 
when we torture it? Let's find out. Now, the um, Cinebench has been a benchmarking tool that people, especially on YouTube or on evaluating websites, will use, which is um, not representative of any actual workloads people do. It's quite extreme in what it does. So with that in mind, let's see how it survives or how it handles it. Now, each one of these tests will run for 10 minutes to warm it up. And usually right in the beginning is where it throws uh, the most amount of work. I'm trying to move this somewhere where we can see both it and me. And we will watch our current temps here, but we also want to keep an eye on our maximum temps. I am just now starting to hear the fan just a little bit. And this will run for a full 10 minutes. So while we're waiting, and we'll keep an eye on what's going on here on our temperatures, and we'll keep an ear on our fan noise if you have any questions, I'll do my best to provide our, an answer for you, even if I'm assuming or guessing, just like with the fan on the NVMe drive. I'm pretty, pretty sure you're not going to get that um, unless you order it with the drive. However, questions like that, you can also direct uh, directly to Mini's form if you want a definitive answer. Um, I haven't ordered one bare bones that ever came with a fan. All right, let's see. I'm just looking to see if I've missed any questions. I'm scrolling up while I was talking. When I'm talking and you guys are talking at the same time, only one of us is listening. So I have to just wait until I'm done talking, then I can go back and see what you've written. And um, that's partly why this happens. There's also a bit of a delay between when I speak and when you hear me. And some people may be starting this video off from the very beginning right now, and it'll be 38 minutes before they catch up with this moment. So that's also another challenge that I have as a content presenter here uh, is I never quite know where in the video the users or the viewers are at when they're asking questions. Sometimes they're asking questions from the past. It gets a little confusing for both the viewer and for me. And sometimes I will turn off the DVR mode to prevent that from happening. It hasn't been a, a noticeable problem lately, but do know that you want to make sure that you're all the way to the right to keep up with us. And of course, if they're 38 minutes behind, it'll be 38 minutes before they hear me tell them that. So it's like talking to somebody out in space. You say it and then you wait 10 minutes <laughs> and then they reply. And then 10 minutes after that, you get your response. So hello and then hello back takes 20 minutes. But if you know that, Creates a lot less confusion for both of us. Nick Caffrey says, I have five peripherals, two external drives, two printers, a scanner, two display port monitors via a splitter. On a Mini's forum machine, what, in your opinion, is the best way to cope with these? Well, it sounds like you've got some old equipment you don't want to let go of. That's what it sounds like. All right. And so this old equipment is just going to continue to be a ball and chain around your ankle. For example, I have one printer that has a scanner built into it. So it's also wireless. 
I don't have to plug it in. I'm, I'm, that's one cable less I have to deal with. I also don't have to worry about the printer being located next to the computer. I could literally put the printer anywhere in the house and give it that it's also a scanner. Also tells me that um, that's another peripheral that I don't need to make room for. Then when you talk about external drives, in my opinion, those drives should only be plugged in when you're using them. And so for me personally, I would not recommend leaving external drives plugged in as though they were outboard storage. If that were the case, I would use a network attached storage device, which again is a separate device. You put it on your network, you can put it anywhere you want. You can access it wirelessly. You don't have to wire uh, the Minis Forum machine up. You can use Wi-Fi. And, um, you know, uh, for me personally, when I hear what you've got, it sounds like what you've got is some old equipment you don't want to let go of. And you want to know what's the best way to hook this old equipment up to new equipment. And that's always going to be difficult. And it's only going to get worse. Old equipment works best with old equipment. New equipment works best with new equipment. And I'm making an assumption here, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But sometimes it's just time to let things go. Um, and if you didn't have a reason before, you'll have one now. With that being said, you could plug both of your external drives and your DisplayPort monitors into this using the HDMI to a DisplayPort converter cable. Uh, you could buy a cable that's literally HDMI on one side and DisplayPort on the other, plug the HDMI side into the mini PC and the DisplayPort into the back of the monitor. Very inexpensive. Um, what else did you have? Let's see. Two external drives, two printers. So I don't know how the printers and scanner connect up, but you could buy, if you don't already have, uh, a, a USB ex, um, hub, a powered USB hub. But here's the thing. You haven't told me how you've hooked these up now. My assumption is that the same way you've got them hooked up now, you're going to hook it up exactly the same to the mini PC. Is there... Are you concerned you're a port short somewhere? Or, I mean, because this easily uh, has five USB ports on it. So I, it actually has more than that. So I, I don't know how you're plugging these things in. But um, that reminds me, we need to take a look in the device manager and we'll see who the manufacturer of the Ethernet LAN adapter is, as well as the Wi-Fi adapter and Bluetooth. But taking a look here at the temps, I haven't been paying attention. We're, we're about seven and a half minutes into this 10 minute test. Our highest temp has been 86. That's really, really good. Really, really good. And I could encourage you to run the same free benchmark on your machine and run the same free uh, temperature monitoring, the HW Info portable version. You don't install anything and see what your temps are by comparison. And then compare what you paid for your system to how much this one sells for. Tell me where you think you got a better deal. <clears throat> Mr. J wants to know, can the built-in graphics do 144 hertz refresh? This, these are 60 hertz at 4K. So at 1440, I don't know. That I don't know. In fact, I would say no one's ever asked me that question in the history of this channel. So it's not a common question. But uh, for questions I don't know the answers to, you can always ask Minisform directly at their uh, email address or, or reach out to them on Twitter. A fair enough question. If I can't answer it, I guess you, you got me stumped on that one. Selden Bell wants to know, is this AI image generation is becoming popular? Do you expect to do any stable diffusion benchmark tests? The problem with uh, a lot of the AI generated stuff is a lot of it's happening on a server side. It's not necessarily happening on the desktop. So if you go to uh, any of like hyper.ai or, or suno.ai, all of that's happening on their side and you're just getting the results. So I would need to know what software you're using and whether or not that software 
takes advantage of or requires a neural processing unit or an NPU. Because most processors in the market right now have no NPUs, I don't know how beneficial it's going to be to do those benchmarks. However, the industry is always changing and evolving and we change and evolve with it, but it's impossible in, in my opinion, completely fruitless to try and second guess or to stay ahead of it. You just need to keep up. So when that becomes, and if that becomes a concern for people, then that'll be clearly some, sort of, some form of benchmark we will run for testing that. However, when we're dealing once again with processors that don't contain neural processing units, I don't foresee any advantage to running any AI benchmarking on them. Also, AI benchmarking at this point, as I mentioned, is being primarily run on the server side of things, not on the workstation. That's likely going to change. And there are some AI uh, software packages out there that run on the workstation, but that's not what's being used mostly right now. That being said, uh, we'll, it'll be a wait and see game and we'll respond accordingly. Um, how the industry shifts, we just keep up. So I mean, it's impossible for me to predict. I don't know. Probably <laughs> there'll be some sort of AI test at some point, but too early for me to wonder when or what that test is going to be. <clears throat> are you aware of any PC reviewers that are doing that now? Any content creators that do that? I'm not aware of any. I, I can't say I've ever seen anybody do that. I mean, I've seen AI people, people that want to review AI, run benchmarks, but I've not seen a PC reviewer run an AI benchmark. That doesn't mean it's not happening. I uh, just haven't seen it yet. Nick Caffrey says, you're right, but a black and white laser, inkjet, and dedicated scanner. One external drive is connected only once a month and the others are just to keep a copy. Yeah, so I don't see why you'd have any problem. You should be able to plug everything in exactly the same way as you've got it now. Unless I'm missing something, is there a shortage of ports that you're concerned about? He says it has less ports than a Steel Legend I.O. Well, Steel Legend is the ASRock motherboard, right? So when you're dealing with a motherboard that's five or six times the size of a mini PC, it can have more on it. It's sort of like comparing a personal pizza to a large pizza. You know, the amount you can put on it. You have less real estate on the small and more on the large, but you're also gonna pay more for the large. It's gonna take up more room. So you have to pick what's right for you and what, re what your requirements are. For a lot of people, a lot of regular common end users, they think a computer is a big, ugly box. So if we can kind of minimize that and get it out of the way, that's very appealing for your common end user, right? But that may not be you. But I don't foresee you having any difficulty. I don't think you're using anywhere near all the ports that the Steel Legend offers. So having fewer than what you're using would be a concern. But having more than what you're using, you're not using them anyway. Anything you have that you're not using, you might as well not have. What difference would it make if you had it or you didn't, if you're not using it or it's not bringing you any benefit? How would you miss it if it were gone? How would you even know it was gone? All right, so there's our benchmark on the first test right there. Let's go ahead and run the second benchmark, the uh, single core. Let's go ahead and start that. That again will run for another 10 minutes and bring those temperatures back so we can keep an eye on those. Kyle wants to know what's the best place to get a NAS chassis with only hard drive, well, with no hard drives, so I can buy one and put my own drives in it. Pretty much any NAS, whether it's Synology or QNAP or TerraMaster, you can buy those and all you gotta do is slap drives in it. If you wanna build your own NAS, I don't recommend it. I think it's a hobbyist activity for people with a lot of time who wanna spend three times more time and money to do it all themselves. Um, it's so much cheaper and so much faster to go with the solution that all you have to do is put the drives in. But you can do it either way, it's your choice. There's a great uh, website, or not web, well, I suppose they have a website and a YouTube channel called NAS Compares. 
And there's also one called Space Rex. All one word, NAS compares, N-A-S compares, or, and, you wanna compare? Space Rex. Both of those are excellent resources if you wanna learn more about NAS. Both do it yourself, build it from scratch, and spend a lot more money for a less power efficient machine that requires a monitor, keyboard, and mouse versus a standalone machine like Synology, QNAP, ASUS Store, um, um, Ugreen is even coming out with them, and TerraMaster, which are going to be far more power efficient, far more secure, and not require near as much time to configure. But to each their own. Some people really like that challenge. <clears throat> Let's see, thank you for the question, Kyle. Let's see what else we have here. Dwayne says it looks like the CPU is throttling. I can't really tell if it's throttling. I'm looking at the results. Let me step back up here. And I see a maximum of uh, almost 4,100 megahertz, which is insanity. Um, I see a maximum temperature of 86. Oh, I see. You're looking down on the bottom where it says core thermal throttling. Yes. I don't know that that's telling us that it's happened or that's telling us that it's enabled. Um, kind of, I guess, looking at current minimum and maximum on current thermal throttling says no. On minimum thermal throttling says no. And on maximum Thermal throttling says yes. Well, you know, it may be set in the BIOS to throttle at a lower temperature. Because I can see the CPU package did reach 89 degrees Celsius. So personally, I would feel better knowing that it throttled <laughs> versus waiting if it got up to 100. I would much prefer it never got to 100, me personally. Um, there's some talk about Intel 12th and 13th desktop uh, CPUs causing games to crash after a few months. And NVIDIA says, hey, it's not us, that's Intel. And I don't think it's Intel. I think it's the motherboard manufacturers overvolting those chips straight out of the box without you really being aware of it. And I do have an upcoming video to expose this and show you how you can tell if it's happening to you. Same thing happens with AMDs, but, um, I can't cover them both at the same time. It's too much information. And the complaints right now are that there, we may be seeing a quicker degradation of the CPU on the Intel side than we're seeing on the AMD side. I'm assuming. But either way, you should know how many watts are being sent to your CPU. In some cases, it's two to three times the manufacturer's recommended uh, wattage. And the motherboard makers universally are cranking that up without your knowledge or permission. So I'm gonna show you how you can tell and how you can put it back to Intel specs. People say, well, you lose performance. Yeah, but you gain reliability, you lower your temps, you lower the amount of the cost of the electricity and the heat that it generates, you quiet it down and it'll last longer. So when somebody buys a high performance sports car, if they're gonna drive it, they're probably going to need a lot of maintenance on it. Nobody's buying a Ferrari because of how reliable it is or that it's going to last for a really long time. The only ways Ferraris last a long time is if you pour a lot of money into them or you put them away and don't drive them. So it's kind of like that when we go into this higher end of, uh, uh, you know, seeking out higher performance by essentially causing long-term damage through putting too much power through the chip in order to get a little tiny bit back. You lose all your power efficiency. It doesn't make any sense to me. But the motherboard manufacturers are doing it universally, automatically, and they're not making it clear or easy uh, for the consumer to um, make an informed decision and make that change if they choose to, requiring me to have to make a video to show you separately how to do that on MSI versus ASUS versus ASRock versus Gigabyte. They all do it differently but yet they all do the same thing. They find themselves in a position that 
if they don't do it, they'll be perceived as not being as good as the competitors. Look how much faster my Intel chip runs on the ASUS board because the ASUS board is throwing 400 watts into a 253 watt rated chip. Okay. So I guess that makes the motherboard better. Well, this is the intelligence of the community we're dealing with. This is the mentality. So it's, do we educate them or do you just go with it? And quite frankly, if your goal is to educate them, you're going to go out of business before they're educated. So if you want to keep up with your competitors, you have to do what they're doing, even if you don't agree that it's right. That's the unfortunate reality. If you say, hey, we're sticking to our guns, we are not sending more voltage to the chip without the user's consent. And since most users won't know to do that, to enable it, uh, your competitors will be enabling it by default and not telling the end user. And so the end users that have problems will likely be the ones that are being overvolted without their knowledge. The ones that have a stable, reliable computer that perhaps doesn't run quite as fast on benchmarks, but insignificant for a human being to tell the difference. Those are the ones that are going to have problem-free computer for the next 10 years. So what do you do? What do you do if you're the motherboard manufacturer? And this is the reality. Um, you stick to your guns and go out of business or you keep up with your competitors, even if what they're doing is against everything logical that your engineering standards would otherwise uh, not do. I, I can't blame them. It's pretty messed up. Shamim wants to know if today's video will be added to the mini PCs channel. Uh, yeah, my goal is to get all of the mini PC uh, reviews here over on the mini PCs channel, just kind of edited down a bit. I just haven't had time to do anything for a while. That channel doesn't generate really any revenue, so it's really just a little fun project for me to do on the side and, and to sort of bring all the mini PCs together in one place. Selden Bell says Tom's hardware has published some stable diffusion results. Yeah, but I'm curious if there's any content creators like here on YouTube that are running any of that testing. I'd be curious to see what they're, how they're running it and what they're measuring. Um, that's all new to me. Like I said, all of the AI I use is all processed on the other side. Paul wants to know if I'm seeing any ARM-based CPUs being used in the Windows consumer or business space. Uh, Paul, not yet. Not yet. It's possible that uh, we will see that moving forward. I think the new Microsoft Surface, which I don't even think is out yet, will have that ARM-based CPU architecture. Um, and that, that, I think, is going to be one of the early ones. I don't know of anything ARM-based that's currently out and available yet. And if it is out, I haven't seen it, nor have I heard of anything. So uh, we'll see. I don't know what else to say. We just have to wait and see. Um, as many people shift away from, especially when we talk about consumers, they shift away from a traditional box and move over to their cell phone or their tablets. Because a lot of consumers don't need the hassle and the space that a PC takes up. They've already got their phone. And if their phone can already do everything, as long as they're okay with the screen and they take it with them wherever they go, which is way more convenient than taking a tablet, a laptop, or certainly a desktop, you've got your phone with you anyway. And so the computer becomes redundant to a lot of consumers. But in business, the computer is critical to actually getting any work done a lot of typing and reading that has to get done. You need a bigger screen. You've got an employee that'll be sitting at a desk, whether they're working locally or remotely. Working remotely on a phone would be, for most jobs, quite, quite difficult. So, uh, you know, the ability to plug in speakers or to put a headset on to, if you have, say you're working remotely and you need to be able to answer the office phone, how would you do that on a cell phone. I suppose you could do that with a bunch of adapters and wires, but at that point, 
you might as well have a desktop PC. Uh, so I, it's really hard to know the shifting uh, chaotic behaviors of the consumers. Business is pretty easy to determine. Business is going to stick with what is the most reliable, the most available, and the cheapest. Not necessarily in that order. So if the ARM-based processors are not really going to have any negative impact, but they're going to be cheaper and widely available, we're going to see an influx of them. On the other hand, if they're hard to get, or they don't, there are some applications or hardware that doesn't work with them, if that's the case, uh, doesn't meet the business's need because of it, yeah, it's probably not going to be much of, uh, of an influx. On the other hand, if it's essentially to the business, six of one and half dozen of the other, they're going to go with the one that's the cheapest if everything else is equal, right? If everything else with regards to reliability, performance, and all we're talking about now is primarily price and whether or not it's available, business needs are sort of what can you get me today that's usually you know a priority get it done today but also get it done today under a certain price like there's usually a budget and so sometimes something has to give sometimes in business you have to say i can't get it to you today at that price i can get it to you today for this price or i can get it to you next month at that price and usually because businesses need to spend money to make money the more they hold off the more money they're losing so a lot of times they'll time will take precedent over money let's get it whatever we can get today right now the sense of urgency is there because until they have that piece of equipment they won't add any more productivity so <clears throat> with a consumer it's a very different mindset Mark Jones wants to know, Kerry, what do you think will be the next big thing in the computing world? Well, I don't know what next is, but I know in the future, quantum computing is going to be a big thing. Upcoming AI is incredibly exciting. I think that people don't really comprehend how much better AI is going to make your life. They have AI therapists that you can talk to. Instead of waiting for an appointment to talk to a, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, perhaps you can talk to an AI bot right now that essentially gives you all the same information, maybe more accurately and more thoroughly than any human being could, available at your phone without you getting up, making an appointment, or having to go anywhere. The AI music generation, that Suno AI, is frighteningly good. Frighteningly good. So I can only imagine where AI is going with regards to the medical field, with regards to, you know, when you want information, you Google it, right? And even Google answers now are coming up with an AI response first. Have you noticed that started happening? And it's amazing how accurate that AI response is. And it's, it's really, really bad today compared to if we look back on this a year from now. We're going to say, wow, look how terrible it was. And as mind-blowing it is as it is today, in a year from now, we're going to look back at it and go, look how pathetic that was compared to what it is today. So we've got that to look forward to, which of course scares a lot of people, and maybe rightfully so. But anytime we have a big change, uh, when bicycles were invented by, or not invented by, but the, the safety bicycle, which the Wright brothers were originally making bicycles, uh, parents didn't like the idea of their kids being able to get on a bicycle and, and go much further than they could walk in a day and come back. What good could come of that? So they wanted to ban bicycles. Whenever there's a big shift in the change of, uh, of our culture, it is generally the older people that are resistant and the younger people that embrace it. And here's a spoiler alert. The younger people always win. Always. So... Whether or not you're afraid of it will not change it. So my suggestion is see the benefit of it, understand the dangers of it, and just like a hammer or any other tool, if it's misused, it, it can cause a lot of damage. But when it's used properly, it can save you a lot of time and effort and money. So.
you know, you can use a screwdriver to turn a screw or to stab somebody. It's the same tool. It's just being used differently. All right, so we're done running the tests. We've got our results on the screen, and we've got, looks like uh, 86 is still the high. It doesn't tell us how many times it thermal throttled, but thermal throttling in and of itself is not a bad thing. If it didn't thermal throttle, it could damage the processor, and you would blue screen and crash the machine. So to temporarily shut some of the cores off in order for the, the CPU to cool down, keeps the machine moving forward, perhaps not at its ultimate performance, but you couldn't do that on a car either. If you put your foot all the way to the floor, especially if you have like a turbo enhanced engine or supercharger, you're gonna overheat the engine. So this is just normal when it comes to performance. You, performance is not meant to get all the way up to the top and just stay there. Because otherwise that means there's overhead this whole time. If you could do that, then that means there's overhead there that you're not using. So we're embracing, we're grabbing all of that overhead until it heats up and then we drop it down to regular performance levels temporarily. And once it cools down, it jumps back up and this happens in seconds in most cases. Most people would never know the CPU was throttling. I mean, unless it's excessive. Like if it's, if it's throttling for you know, 10 minutes or you know, some excessive period of time, you're definitely gonna feel like something's wrong with the computer. It will become slower, more unresponsive. And that usually means something's wrong with it. That, that would not be considered normal operation. That would suggest to me that the cooling isn't working properly. Something is blocking the fans or the fans aren't turning or the thermal material isn't there. Something's wrong. But under normal operation, thermal throttling that isn't being used, what's the point in having it? Again, I, I have to tell you, if you're not thermal throttling, you aren't using the peak of your processor's abilities. So seeing that isn't a bad thing, it's a good thing. How we choose to look at something as negative or positive is a choice we make. So if, you, if you're assuming thermal throttling is a bad thing, I can guarantee you if we slow the performance down of this chip, we won't thermal throttle anymore. Which would you prefer? So I'll, I'll take the performance without losing my stability. And that's how we get there. Netfreak mentions the MSI Tomahawk. So I did um, mention this in a tweet last week, two weeks ago. Um, if you're not following me on Twitter, you're probably just repeating information I've already tweeted out and not knowing. But we have, a, we have one of those MSI boards here. It was available for sale on Woot that said it was refurbished and I bought one. And then after it arrived in the mail, the article came out about how their uh, heat sinks or something were cracking and they were being recalled. So maybe that's why they were on sale as refurbished units. I don't know, but we'll take a look at it because uh, it was a good price. And again, I didn't know why it was refurbished or renewed, but likely that's probably why. And it was a great, great deal. <clears throat> but yeah, if you follow me on Twitter, You'll get this information pretty much the day it comes out instead of, you know, two weeks later. All right. Uh, let's see. Mitch Morrison joins us. Hey, there he is. Welcome in, Mitch. Selden's provided a video benchmark Tom's hardware made. So I'm not aware of Tom's hardware making YouTube videos, but if there are any uh, content creators that do PC reviews, because I'm, I'm not aware that Tom's Hardware even had videos. But any of the big content creators, you know who I'm talking about. If they have any content where they're uh, doing this kind of benchmarking, I'd, I'd like to see it. And I appreciate, I appreciate that link, but that's not a channel I watched. I didn't even know they had a channel. So, you know, others like me that do what I do, uh, but perhaps much bigger channels, I'd love to see if they're running those tests and uh, what they're measuring. Since the testing is done, let's take a quick look here at our device manager.
And under network adapters, we can see we've got the Intel i226V on both uh, two and a half gig LAN ports and a MediaTek Wi-Fi 6E Wi-Fi LAN card, which is also Bluetooth. Of course, we're fully Windows 11 compatible here. We do have our TPM security device, which is required for Windows 11 to run properly without circumventing Microsoft's uh, requirements. <clears throat> circumventing the Microsoft requirements for Windows 11 is to me as a tech, it's like when the barriers come down over the, to prevent your car from driving over the train tracks because a train is coming and then some moron drives around the barrier to beat the train. That's the way I see anybody circumventing the security requirements on Windows 11 to force install it onto a non-compliant Windows 11 machine. That is not going to last very long. And I think with the upcoming um, 24H2 update, there's gonna be a lot of remorseful people who wish they didn't do that. You'd have been much better off staying on Windows 10. Windows 10 support is still, as far as I know, ends October 14th, 2025. To the best of my knowledge, they will not extend it. There's some discussion as to whether or not a subscription will be available. Um, typically, that's only been offered to corporations on large subscription scales of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. They did mention that they were talking about offering it to the consumer for $61 for the first year, and then it would double every year thereafter. So if you wanted support for Windows 10 throughout 2025, uh, 2026, you would pay $61. In 2027, you would pay $122. And in 2028, you'd pay $244 if it, in fact, doubles every year. I also think Microsoft's not going to do this. Obviously, the upgrade to Windows 11 is free. Why would you pay money to keep Windows 10? It doesn't make any sense when you could just go to Windows 11 for free. Unless, of course, your computer's not Windows 11 compliant. But then at $244, you're well on your way to a whole new mini PC. So, which would be faster under warranty. It would just be everything brand new and, and likely be better in every facet. However, uh, it's all just conjecture at this point, but I don't expect Windows 10 support for average individuals to continue after October 14th of 2025. Still a long, long way away. That's a... In the life of a hummingbird, that is pretty much a lifetime away. So I don't think it's anything to have any anxiety or concern about. Ask me this time next year, and we'll be a lot closer. Okay, I think I can, let's go close this down here. Close this down here. And you go back full screen on camera one. There I am. Let's see what other questions you've got for me here. Nick Caffrey wants to know, what do you, with all your years of experience, see as the downside of AI at this stage of its evolution? Well, it's got a long way to go, right? So as good as it is, uh, the downside is it's not as good as it's going to be. And when I say it's going to be, I don't mean years from now. I mean, just even a year from now, it'll be remarkably better. Um, People being fooled and tricked has been going on since the dawn of man. And it's gotten easier with the anonymity and the connection, worldwide connection of the internet, where there's very little recourse to anybody getting caught for being a bad person. So when bad people take advantage of other people who they don't even know, who's never done anything to them or their family, just completely unjustified theft for no reason, um, you know, against the person, that's going to get even easier for the thieves, but it's pretty easy right now. So the importance of us as individuals to be able to determine and judge 
what is real from what is fake is going to become more challenging. However, as with uh, the phone, when you see a phone number call you, you don't recognize, do you answer it? Because I don't. And most of the time, they don't leave a voicemail. So if they're not leaving a voicemail, I can't imagine that that was anything but a sales call. If it's somebody I know, they're in my phone book, their name pops up. So I just have my phone just automatically block numbers that aren't in my phone book, and I don't even get bothered with the, the inter interruption of the ring. And at the same time, if they do leave a voicemail, it will beep to let me know a voicemail's been made, even though I never heard the call. That's okay, because if it's a voicemail for somebody I want to hear from, I will add them to my phone book, and that won't happen in the future. But this prevents being swindled by somebody saying they're the bank or claiming to be what they're not. Human beings are going to be human beings. And AI is just another tool like any other that can be used to benefit society or it can be used to, for individuals to profit from at the expense of others, typically strangers, just completely random individuals that are more gullible that will become victims uh, no differently than they're becoming victims today with all the scam calls. And, you know, when was the first time I did a scamming the scammers video? Was that 10 years ago or longer? They're still doing that today. So AI is not going to make that go away. Um, the same skills that you use today to determine if the person on the other end of the phone is real or not are likely going to be the same skills you're going to need as more and more goes to AI to determine what's real or not. The question is, will it get so good that it's impossible to tell? And if that becomes the case, then the only way to do any financial transaction is to initiate it yourself or to do it in person. So being in person is going to become more valuable, you know, especially for anything involving any type of a sale you're less likely going to be scammed by somebody facing you in reality versus, you know, a phone call or an email. Congratulations, you've won. Hey, it's the post office. We're having trouble delivering your package. Really? Like nobody thinks, when did the post office get my phone number? They just think, oh no, the post office is having trouble delivering my package. They didn't take a step back and go, how could they have my phone number? When have you ever given the post office your phone number? It's weird. Very strange. And people get swindled by it. Like, just not thinking. It's unprecedented. It's not like you get emails from the post office all the time. Oh, here comes another one. <laughs> you literally never get them unless it's a scam. Or unless you specifically went on the Postal Service website and requested that they email you something. And even then, knowing the Postal Service, you're not going to get it. But, you know, what are you going to do? So that's, I suppose, the potential uh, dark side of it. But people's responsibilities are still going to be on them. It's not my responsibility to protect you. Welcome to, you know, welcome to life. You've got to watch out for yourself and your family. Probably nobody else is. Nick Caffrey wants to know, will this point to a resurgent of the high street shop in the physical bank? You know what? It's, it's very difficult to see the future with any clarity. Your guess is as good as mine. We don't know what the AI is going to look like, how it's going to interact, where the potential confusion might be, how the public will react to it, and how the culture of the public will react to it. Will it be something they embrace, like a smartphone? Or will it be something they shove away, like an Apple Newton or a Microsoft Zoom? How can we know what's going to happen? I think we're trying to be prepared. I think that's the idea behind your question. But it's sort of like you're preparing for something that's based solely on your imagination and not on any reality. So is that preparation nothing more than unnecessary anxiety and a waste of time? Since it's like you're trying to know 
when I spin the ball at the roulette table, when I spin the wheel and send the ball rolling, is that going to come up as red or black? I want to be ready. Tell me now. And that you would say, well, Carrie, that's unreasonable. That's gambling. Well, that's what you're doing right now. You're, you're, you're asking me to project something I have no control over that none of us have any control over that is completely chaos. And we just don't know. But what we do know is there won't be anything that happens that we can't handle and address. So whatever that happens to be until it arrives, um, you know, unless we see it coming, unless it's very clearly heading our way, we can give a heads up. But in most cases, we never see it coming. It just sort of, just sort of happens naturally. And it may not even be obvious to you that it's happening, sort of like the evolution of the smartphone. It, it may not have been obvious once the uh, majority of society started to embrace that and step away from flip phones. It might have been uh, that you were an early adopter, or it might have been that everybody you knew had one but you before you got one. But either way, once the change occurred, we deal with it. And however we seem appropriate, once we have the factual information to base a decision on. But basing a decision on conjecture and imagination, it, it's, it's like playing a game um, that you're not likely going to win. So, I don't know. If, if there's a game that's being played and I know that the chances of me winning that game are very low, eh, it's not really a game I want to play. It takes the fun out of it if you can't win. What's the point? I got to believe I can win. All right. James Prezi says, I follow you on Twitter. Right on. Well, there you go. So you'll see a lot of information that I don't have time to make videos on that I have either retweeted or posted myself there on Twitter. So if you want to keep up on the latest information, you're going to get it sooner from me on Twitter than you will here. It happens there first. It happens here second. Does anybody have any questions about the Minis Forum NAB9 that we have here? Um, any concerns? Anything that uh, I haven't covered about the unit? Ian McLoyd said, Skynet is here. Well, uh, some people hear opportunity knocking and complain about the noise. So you can choose to see it in a positive way or a negative way. It is a voluntary choice that you make. I suggest choose happiness because the reality won't change. Um, because you see reality in a negative way doesn't make it negative, And because you see reality in a positive way doesn't make it positive. But one makes you happy and one makes you sad. And since that's a, ch a choice you voluntarily control, it takes the same amount of energy and effort. Why not choose happiness? John Williams says, thanks for sharing this awesome mini. Have a great weekend. Well, thanks for hanging out with us, John. It's just another evolution of the Minis Forum lineup. I think it's great that they're reusing or, or keeping the same case design because it's something familiar. Um, there's no reason to change that out. It's really what's in the case that matters. And if you've got a good case design, let's keep it. Let's keep using it. That saves us money as consumers that we're not paying for a whole new tooling of a factory to accommodate a new design when it doesn't offer any benefits other than looks, just aesthetics. So if we've got a functional design that looks fantastic, let's keep using it. I'm, I'm right behind Mini's Forum on that decision for sure. You saw me struggle with a mini PC from a different manufacturer trying to figure out how to open it up. 
it wasn't clear and it didn't open up like any other mini PC I'd ever seen. So using something familiar and relatively obvious, stick with it. Yeah, just make sure the internals get updated, that's all. Does it come in gray? As far as I know, it only comes in this silver color. I'm not aware that there's any other color. I've never seen um, this particular case design from Minisform, regardless of what the model is that repurpose or reuse this case, uh, past models. They're all silver. It's one color. So I guess you can have it in any color you want, as long as the color you want is silver. Um, if you're looking for cases that come in multiple colors, I think you'd have to switch to a different manufacturer because I don't think Minis Forum offers different colors. I think you're thinking of B-Link and B-Link has been mysteriously quiet for the last year with really nothing new coming out. So I don't know what's going on over there, but it's pretty strange. They were coming out and innovating with new stuff regularly. And they've just kind of dropped off the face of a cliff. I don't know where they went. But they were the ones that would offer multiple colors. Nick Caffrey says on the NAV9 page, there was an ad for the MSO1, which looks savage. Yeah, we did a review on the MSO1 about two or three months ago. It's a monster of a machine. And uh, absolutely. It's, it's bigger. It's physically um, not as tall, but it's two and a half times the size of this width-wise. And uh, it's an absolute monster, for sure. And if you're interested in it, be sure and go back and watch our video review on that from a few months ago. UFO man said, my glass is always half empty. Is it possible your glass is simply too big? Because if it were a smaller glass and you poured it into that, wouldn't that glass be full? Hmm. Did you ever think of that? Gabriel says hello. Jeff H says he painted his mini flat black and it looks great. I could imagine painting these wouldn't be that difficult. You'd obviously want to remove the innards and uh, tape off any areas that you didn't want to have painted. But it's such a small thing. Um, I would imagine prepping it so the paint sticks properly over time would be important. And I'm definitely, I have no skills in painting or woodworking. I'm the last guy you'd want to do it. So... I'm not aware of that many people, honestly, who approach me with the technical question of what color does it come in. Like usually the questions I'm answering are, can it run this software? How fast is it? How much RAM does it have? How much storage does it have? It's interesting to see the shift that life has become so good, that life has become so easy that performance becomes secondary to how it looks. And I get that in orange. Um, from my perspective, you know, my first computer was back in the early 1980s. And there was a lot more money than this. And I got a lot less and it was a lot bigger and a lot slower and it consumed a lot more power. And it was just a, a green screen or an amber screen CRT. Came in one size and um, I was exceptionally grateful to have it. It never occurred to me, ever, that I should take it and paint it a different color from beige. Like, that was so inconsequential. Um, it's sort of like looking at my tools, wrenches and screwdrivers, and deciding whether or not I want to buy them based on what color they are. When I'm wrenching on a car or I'm working with power tools, 
I don't care if I've got the Dewalt yellow or the Milwaukee red or the Ryobi green. I care about how much impact the driver has, what the battery life is, how heavy the tool is, how reliable the tool is, how it fits the hand. You know, what's the warranty? How long does the battery last? How long does the battery need to charge? Can I use the battery in multiple devices or do I have to buy a different battery and charger for every device? So for that reason, I buy Ryobi tools because I can use their OnePlus battery on like 200 different tools. So you don't have to have a variety of chargers and batteries. I don't care what color it is. Like to me, that's missing the whole point of why I'm buying the tool. I'm not buying it to hang it on the wall as artwork. I'm buying it as a tool to accomplish a job I'm trying to do. If I was mowing lawns, it wouldn't matter to me what color my lawn mower was. It doesn't change how quickly I'm gonna get the lawn mowed and how much money I'm gonna make. But if it costs more to get it custom painted, I'm not quite sure that's a sound investment in my business. But maybe it could be if you're branding, I don't know. Uh, I find it quite an unusual question because I expect technical questions. I expect uh, warranty questions, cost questions. And while I do open the floor to the questions, more and more I'm hearing questions that care more about how it looks than how it performs. And so that's just very opposite of everything that I looked for, right? Because everything keeps getting better and better. And we've reached a point, I guess, where the differences now in generations are so minute that now we have the luxury and the entitlement to care about what color is it. It's very strange to me. I'm just kind of baffled and amused that that would be a concern, especially as small as it is. If it was bigger and it was something more people were gonna see, makes more sense. I wouldn't do all this if I didn't have a YouTube channel. There's nobody to see this for, if, without the YouTube channel, who would see that? Just me? Somebody who comes over? Who am I doing this for? So some people, it's really important to, and they'll spend a lot more money for this, by the way, a lot more. There's more profit on those LEDs than there are on the components that actually matter. But you know, it's your money, it's your priority. Nobody's ever paid me to come out and fix their LEDs. It's never happened. Never got an emergency call. My LEDs are out. I need you over here right now. I don't think it's ever going to happen. <clears throat> Peter contributes one euro. Thank you, Peter. Paul Connolly said, my customers don't care what color my tools are or even less who makes them. No, it's very much a consumer question. Ian McLeod wants to know, what color is the RAM inside of my PC that I hardly ever open? Yeah, who cares? It's very strange. But whether or not I find it strange, it, it doesn't change the reality that there are a growing number of people that are more concerned with aesthetics with regards to computers than they are with the performance or the cost. Um, usually, uh, the way I was raised in this industry, it's always been about value. You know, how much can I get for the money? That's where my focus has been in my industry is offering my clients not the best at any price and not the lowest and worst at the cheapest price. I've said this before and I'll say it as many times as necessary. We're always looking for the best bang for the buck at that time. So where's the best value? If you were to divide how much each megahertz that your processor is delivering by the, how much it costs to buy that processor, which processor offers you the most megahertz for the dollar today, right now, that you can buy? Doesn't do you any good if it's not in stock. Or do you just go after what's ever the best, meaning you're gonna pay the most, deal with heat problems, and then greatly depreciate very, very quickly compared to the better valued system that will cost you less and won't depreciate as quickly. Now, depreciation doesn't really matter unless you're planning to resell it. 
And for a lot of people who buy the very best, what you need to understand about those people is they don't just buy the best and keep it for 10 years. Not usually. Generally, the people who buy the best need the next best and the one after that and the one after that. Most of my customers don't have that budget, but there are people who do and they prioritize. You know, they may not wear fancy clothes or drive a nice car. They might live in an apartment and not own a house and have any equity in anything, but they've got the latest and greatest CPU that just came out. And they always do because that's their priority and that's how they choose to, uh, that's what's important to them. But that doesn't represent the majority, but it does represent the majority of people who make content on YouTube where they want to show off the latest and greatest. I'm not sure as a viewer, you're really getting much out of that other than for most of us wishing you could have something like that. For most of us, it's off, off limits price wise. I think most viewers would be better served waiting for the hype to die down and then for a content creator to go, hey, remember this thing I showed you last year that was X amount of dollars that was impossible to get? They cannot give them away today. So you can buy it at a fraction of the cost, not wait in any line to get it. You get the exact same part one year later, but you pay a lot less. I think that would be more appealing to most people because that for most people would be far more attainable and they could see universally the value in that. But the enthusiasts who make the content, well, there's a reason why they're called enthusiasts. Most computer users are users. They're not enthusiasts. They're not people that say, give me the best at any price at all times. That is what an enthusiast does. Overall, defining the kind of content you see here on YouTube from enthusiasts, it is usually highlighting whatever the latest and greatest is, and they want to be the first or one of the first to present it to you. I mean, if you're another enthusiast, I see the point of that, but most computer owners are not enthusiasts, but most video creators are in this subject matter. So you can see where it doesn't balance out and how there's a misconception from regular viewers thinking they need that latest and greatest because of how exciting the content creator made it sound. And then they see the price and then they feel bad they can't afford it. When in fact, it probably wouldn't really offer them any benefit other than, you know, psychologically feel like they're keeping up when there's no reason to keep up. If it's, if your computer is doing what you need it to do and you are supported, in other words, you're getting updates, you don't have to keep up because, because your kids came over and said, why are you still running this old machine? What do they care? What are they trying to sell you a machine? Are they making commission? Don't worry about it. If it's a supported machine and it meets your needs, whether it's coworkers or friends or family, kids, grandkids, anybody who insults what you have, it's an insult, right? It's like you have a, a perfectly good working older car. And some kid who doesn't really understand the value of a dollar wants to know why you don't have a brand new car. Why, why are you still driving this three-year-old car? You could have a new car. Why, why are you driving this old piece of junk? You're like, well, first of all, it's not old. Second of all, it's not a piece of junk. And third, you're not paying for it. And there's nothing wrong with it. And you can get out and walk if you don't like it. That's what I would have been told if I would have said those things as a child. I would have been told, you can walk. So the fact that, that people's reaction has changed, right? Where they think, oh, I really should do something about that. No, not necessarily. Unless you yourself are the one who brought it up saying, hey, this thing's really old. I need to replace it. If somebody else is telling you that, imagine they told you that about you. You know, hey, you're really old and should be replaced. How would you react to that? It's, it's an insult every way you slice it. It's like, well, what business is it of yours, right? Unless you're trying to sell me something. And if what I have isn't good enough for you, there's the door. Just leave, you know, that's a heck of a way to have a guest treat you. Even if that guest is family, it's uh, uncalled for. But 
people often respond to it. Like I'll get calls from consumers going, you know, my kids tell me I should change my computer. And I go, well, why? What's wrong with it? Well, it's old. Okay, but what's wrong with it? Is it not doing something you need it to do? You know, what is it? Are you running Windows 7 still? Is it, is it something that's not supported? A lot of times the end user doesn't know if what they've got supported. And if you ask an end user, are you running Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10, Windows 11? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I'm running. That's what you deal with as a technician in the real world. But more and more, those consumers, they're switching over to smartphone and tablets, <clears throat> and maybe they didn't immediately embrace the full usage of them. Maybe initially they used them for phone calls and a little texting, and then maybe checking email, and then maybe doing this, and maybe watching YouTube videos. And then before you know it, they don't need to go back to the PC anymore. And they find that they've slowly adapted everything onto their portable device and realized, I can free this whole desk up for something else I'd rather have than a computer. And they don't miss it. So unless it's remote work, that's a different story. But for just a consumer to have as a tool, a lot of times all they need is the phone. And again, they've got that everywhere they go. They don't have to go to the computer. The computer goes with them. So there's definitely an advantage to that, depending on how you use it. Ian Gooch with a 10 pound super chat says, hey, Carrie, here's a small donation for your coffers. Well, thank you, Ian. Or should I say cheers? UFO man says, I cannot wait for the NVIDIA 5090s to come out. That way I can get a hardly used 4090 bargain on eBay. There's some truth to that for sure. Gabriel says he likes the camera quality. It looks amazing. Thank you, Gabriel. David Martinez says camera girl did an amazing job with the Instagram logo. Absolutely. Yes. Shane Perkins said, uh, talking about the aesthetics and things, uh, the changing priorities, that this reminds him of audio enthusiasts that would show off high-end stereo equipment in a car that would barely run. Yeah, I mean, I've seen that too. I've seen, heck, I was one of those people. I had a $300 car with a $1,200 stereo system in it back in 1984. So what are you going to do? <laughs> but that's the mentality of a 16-year-old, right? And believe me, I could not afford that stereo. I worked my butt off at minimum wage, but I also wasn't paying rent, you know, still living with the parent. I'm 16 years old, right? So it was all expendable cash. And that was a priority in my life then. And then when you ask me why my ears are ringing all the time and I can maybe be a little hard of hearing, well, that might have been self-inflicted at my own expense when I could least afford it, only to have somebody ultimately steal it out of the car. What are you going to do? UFO man says, we're putting innocent people in jail for an AI glitch. Are you new here? They've been putting innocent people in jail for all kinds of different reasons. AI glitch is just adding to more and more reasons why innocent people get falsely arrested. But that's always been going on. So what if there's another excuse? You know what I mean? It's not like it's changing anything. And there's always consequences to that as well. And the folks responsible will, will pay. And when it costs them enough, they'll make sure it doesn't happen again. But that's just more of the same. <clears throat> yeah, 
Yeah, unfortunately, we do we do encounter uh, people in the community that have an air of superiority amongst themselves and their fellow community members, which is, for me, it's disappointing. I don't I don't like to see that. Um, we all have strengths and weaknesses, and what you might be good at, um, somebody that you're sneering or looking down at because they don't know technology well, are likely an expert in something you're a complete moron to from their perspective. So I've worked for doctors and lawyers regularly who are much better educated than I am, far more successful than I am, and couldn't find the power switch on the computer. I would not suggest that they're less intelligent than me. We simply have a different interest. And if you don't agree with my interest, if you don't believe in what I believe, that makes you a lesser person than me. It's not something I can get on board with. I'm sorry and for humans at this point to still have that very primal tribal thought process is not something um, I can condone. And, you know, I can suggest and recommend you be aware of it so you don't fall trapped to that. It's, it's all an insecurity um, coping mechanism. And it's unfortunate to witness it, but it, it is what it is. And uh, at this point, if you recognize it, then react accordingly, which is likely not to engage. Just walk away. There's a, an expression that trying to be reasonable with an unreasonable person would be an unreasonable thing to do. And, I, you know, we see this like in the Linux community. There's a lot of superiority there. If there's one reason I won't use Linux, it's because of the community. Um, it has nothing to do with the operating system. It has to do with the stigma of the most vocal Linux users acting like they're better than everybody else or they know more. That's the biggest turnoff for me that would have prevented my natural curiosity from exploring it. Because my concern is if I like it, I will now be associating as one of those people, even though I don't want to and I don't behave that way, by default, by including myself in that group, it's simply not a group I want to be associated with. And that's unfortunate for the operating system because it, it may have been something I would have embraced, but the community is so toxic, I would prefer to avoid it. And again, that's not to say all Linux users behave that way, but it's the vocal ones. The most vocal, and unfortunately the most vocal appear to be a majority when they're not. And that's usually the case with anything online. People complaining and cancel culture is usually a very small, small percentage of people that are extraordinarily loud. They have big mouths, big virtual mouths to emulate that they're more than what they appear to be. Again, it's an insecurity mechanism. It's there to fool you. Um, how you choose to respond to it, the first thing you got to do is recognize what it really is not what it's wanting you to see. You gotta look through that, see what it truly is. And then respond accordingly, or don't. <laughs> but I just strongly recommend people don't take anything on the surface for what it wants you to think it is. That's why I do these in-depth reviews that take two hours to get done. So I like to dig down deeper beyond the marketing materials and really explore what does this mean in reality, right? When we open it up, is it easy to work on? Are there limitations? Are there things, pros or cons, that, need, that should be considered when using it that isn't really in the marketing material? I've had people ask me about whatever the best something is. One that intrigues me is what's the best wireless router? The wireless router manufacturers don't lie on their websites or on the sales pages at Amazon or Newegg with what their performance is, what their processor is. And this assumes an ideal Wi-Fi environment, best case scenario. But what they don't know is 
How many devices are you hooking up to it? Will you be in an area that's congested with other Wi-Fi signals? Will you be connecting older devices to it? And if so, how many? Over what distance? In a building made of what material? Going through floors, walls? If so, how many and what are they made of? All of this will affect your individual experience with any router. So if you're asking me or literally anybody on the planet, what's the best router for me? And I don't know you and I don't know the answer to any of these questions. The only way to know is for you to buy one and plug it in and see if it works for you in your environment with you, your unique expectations and budget and devices you're connecting to it and the building and just the neighbors that you have. And if you're in an apartment or a dorm versus, I don't know, a, a house in the woods versus an urban area or a condo or a duplex. I mean, it's impossible. It's impossible to know. But what you can know is generally the more you spend when it comes to technology, the more you get to a point of diminishing returns. In other words, if you get a Wi-Fi 6 router, are you going to see much benefit moving to Wi-Fi 6E or Wi-Fi 7? As an average user, you won't notice any difference whatsoever. Nothing. But as an enthusiast, it might be something that's worth spending the extra few hundred dollars for. But that's ultimately a decision you have to make and use it, because I still don't know how you're going to use it. So generally speaking, the enthusiast will find the reason to justify the purchase, where the consumer's basically buying because they have to. I have to have a Wi-Fi router. I don't want to go get one. I just have to. <laughs> so what's the cheapest one that'll get the job done? And then the enthusiast, the enthusiast wants to know what's the best one. I can't answer either one. It just depends on the environment, the expectations and the budget. Nobody can answer that question other than the person asking it. And that's something you can tell me. You can say, hey, I bought that router and I plugged it into my place and my place is uh, a house, it's a multi-story house, it's a condo, it's an apartment, whatever. I'm hooking up a bunch of old 802.11b stuff to it. I've got a bunch of IoT stuff. I've got a bunch of kids with cell phones that are streaming Netflix all day and playing TikTok videos. Didn't work with a damn or it's been the best thing since sliced bread. It could be the exact same router from two completely different individuals who don't know each other. One person abhors it, the other person loves it. Who's right, who's wrong? Paul Connolly says, thankfully, everyone here has made me feel welcome, even though I'm a Mac OS X guy. Get out. I mean, I'm not sure what benefit my channel would have to an Apple owner, but we're certainly glad you're here and join us and that you're a part of the community because it's an amazing one regardless. I noticed when I, when I don't shave, I keep touching my face. My OCD is like, yeah, you know what? It's still there. <laughs> I might have to go back to shaving regularly. I'm creating new habits and I'm catching myself doing it. What am I doing? Why am I touching my face? Oh yeah, not used to having the, the scruff. So we have a bunch of videos coming out that uh, I just need to find the time to do. I still have some borrowed equipment from our friend Patrick over at Serve the Home that I'm looking forward to reviewing just for the fun of it. A NAS, some mini PCs, some extra stuff he had laying around he wasn't using anymore. And then when I'm done with it, 
I take it back over to him and uh, he just posted on his Twitter feed, he just picked up a cyber truck. So I can't wait to see that in person. <clears throat> he says he's like a movie star everywhere he goes now because that cyber truck, there's so few of them here in the Phoenix area, you very rarely see one. Mitch mentions he saw one on the freeway the other day. And we both think it was probably Patrick that he saw. Because <laughs> otherwise, you really don't see him. And he and Patrick live on the same side of town. So that kind of adds up. But uh, I won't return that stuff to him, obviously, till I'm done with it. I haven't even started with it yet. That's how backed up things have become over here. And then, of course, the Intel voltage thing. Dealing with the overvoltage that primarily is affecting uh, 12th, 13th, and 14th gen Intel chips. And I think the story that's come out about these chips failing in gaming after two or three months of use, I'll bet you it's going to come down to that over, the overwattage the motherboards are doing. I don't think Intel's done anything wrong other than perhaps not send a, de a cease and desist order to the motherboard manufacturers to overvolt the chips by default without the consumer's consent. If you follow one of my how to build videos here and you buy a 12th, 13th or 14th gen Intel chip in any motherboard, any, not just an unlocked board, not a Z board, that doesn't have to be a K processor, any, they all overvolt the chip and trying to figure out if it's happening and how to correct it is not for the light of heart. It is a very technical thing. And I've got one of each motherboard. I've got an ASUS board, an ASRock board, Gigabyte board, and an MSI board. And I'm gonna show you where you go in the BIOS and look for each of these manufacturers. But do know that even when the model changes, sometimes the BIOS changes. So there's no possible way for me to simplify this other than to say, in general, this is what we're looking for. And if you have this motherboard manufacturer, perhaps you'll find it in the same place in the BIOS as where I'm showing you, but I can't possibly cover every variant. So the best I can do is give you the idea of what I'm looking for in the general area of where to find it. And then once you've found it, how to know where it should be set to. And if it's not set to that, which it will not be, and I'm referring to the, the um, power level uh, settings, power level one and power level two. So you would Google whatever chip you have, Intel 12400KF or whatever it is, <clears throat> along with the word PL1 and PL2. And Google will respond with what the manufacturer's default settings are, recommended settings. You go into your BIOS and you see what your default power levels are. And if they don't match that, you're overwatting your chip, basically. A lot of people say overvolting. In this case, where it's measured in watts. You can do it either way. But the bottom line is the, the BIOS is going to refer to it as watts. The PL1 and PL2 will be related in watts. It's like millimeters and inches. It's the same measurement being told in a, a different value system. So we talk a lot about temperatures on Celsius, whereas as Americans, we generally use Fahrenheit. But because it's so universally reported as Celsius, we... As Americans, I don't know what 32 degrees Celsius is in Fahrenheit, but I do know that 100 degrees Celsius is the throttle junction for a lot of chips. And I want to stay clear of that. So any more than 90 makes me uncomfortable if the throttle's at 100. So even though I couldn't necessarily tell you specifically my definition of that as I know it in Fahrenheit, I do know that when it gets too hot, and in the same way, if we talk about volts or we talk about watts or amps, they're all sort of, what is it? Volts times watts equals amps or something. I can't remember the formula. And it's been years since I've worked with electronics at that level. I took a class in high school. That was fun. We got to make our own circuit boards and soak them in acid to make the etchings and then put them on a drill press to drill the holes for the components. I made a strobe light. They wouldn't let you do that today because, you know, it's an open 120 volts without a case. You could easily electrify, uh, perhaps not kill yourself, but get one heck of a shock without any protection. It was just sort of like uh, self-preservation at that point. Patrick Manny renews membership for now a 23rd month of membership. Thank you, Patrick. 
He says, one more month and it's going to be two years, Carrie. I know. Can you believe it? Crazy. Edward says 100 degrees Celsius is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Woo! That's almost pizza cooking temperature. I have seen frozen pizzas that say to set the oven to 350 or sometimes 425, somewhere in there, 375. <clears throat> so 212, more than half. So I don't know, maybe I can cook a pizza, a little tiny pizza, one of these CPUs. Uh, volt times amps equals watts, says Arto. There you go. Thank you for that. Um, the great thing is that, you know, knowing the calculations and conversions isn't important anymore. Ask any child with a cell phone. They'll tell you, why do you know anything? Just Google it. What are you, a dummy? <laughs> I'm like, uh, you heard yourself, right? Okay. All right, we're just at about the uh, two-hour mark here. So I want to thank you all for hanging out with me. We'll check the phone here right quick because I haven't had any time to check it this whole broadcast. And um, see if we've missed anything here. NetFreak sends an Amazon gift card of $1. Thank you so much for that. I wish every viewer sent me a dollar. Uh, that would be amazing. But uh, I'm glad that you did. And uh, Gary Tatum with an Amazon gift card of $25. Very generous, thank you, Gary. And I think that takes care of, oh, wait a minute, $5 contribution came in from David Collins, and he says, thanks for the show. Right on, well, thank you. Thanks to our friends at Minis Forum. Do also remember that our friends at Acronis are offering you a discount, which I think ends in two more days, two days left of the 50% off deal. After that, we dropped to 30% off the rest of the year, to the best of my knowledge. Good time to buy, especially if you don't have a backup solution in place. Acronis makes it easy. Our friends at RoboForm, that's the password manager I've been using for nearly two decades. 30% off for all new users. Our friends at uh, VIP CDK deals, why would you spend all this money for a Windows or a Microsoft Office license? And you can get the exact same license for 90% off and it's 100% on the up and up and personally guaranteed. Guaranteed. So every product that I align myself with and every company I align myself with has to meet my moral and ethical standards. As a business owner that I recommend products to and I'm held accountable for to my customers and my clientele, I don't want to go out of business to make a few extra dollars. I don't want to sell anything stolen, illegal. I don't want to be associated in anything in my business that isn't 100% legit because I want to stay in business. I mean, I might be hungry today. I'm going to be hungry next week and I'm going to be hungry next month. And I'd rather make a smaller amount of money over a longer period of time than just cash in today and then figure out what the heck I'm going to do next week when the money's gone. So. When I work with these companies, you have to understand how many companies I turn away. I probably turned away hundreds of companies. So I hope when you hear me talk about RoboForm or VIP CDK deals or Acronis, what you're hearing me talking about are products that I use myself that I personally stand behind. You are going to be happy with that product or you're going to get your money back within 30 days. If you, look, if you come back after 30 days with a complaint, it sounds like you're the scammer. I'm just telling you. It's something, somebody's trying to work a loophole. Somebody's doing something, it ain't right. These products all have free trials, by the way. So you can download Windows 10 or Windows 11 or Microsoft Office from Microsoft directly as a free trial. You don't need an activation key. That's all 100% on the up and up. You don't have to use BitTorrent or some questionable way to acquire the software. Microsoft makes it available to the public. You do have to buy the key to activate it, but you don't have to pay Microsoft's retail prices. And those keys are guaranteed, guaranteed to work. RoboForm, Acronis, free trials. And you'll know exactly what you're going to get if you decide to buy it. So it's, there's, there's no, 
I know it's hard to believe in today's day and age, but there's no deception here. Everything is completely guaranteed and backed up as far as by the companies themselves, as well as by me personally, should the company not take care of it. And of course the company's gonna take care of it. Do you think they want to piss me off and lose out on potential hundreds of sales because they wanted to keep your $5? I just don't think that would be a wise decision. So you can understand if it's gonna cost them $5 to make a thousand, that's an investment they'll make every day. They're highly motivated to make sure that you're happy, as am I, because I want you to know me as a trusted resource. I don't know that there's many of those online anymore that are at least identifiable. I'm not saying they're, it, it's hard to tell who are the trustworthy ones from who aren't, unless there's some regularity as to the source of the information, right? So if it's just some random post on Reddit, it could be quite useful, or it could be complete deception. But if it's from a poster I recognize and I've followed over the years, then I know they're either, they know what they're talking about or they don't. So I hope that at the very least, whether or not you like the products or whether or not the products solve any particular issue for you, they will save you money from what the general public pays because you're a viewer and uh, they all pass my requirements with regards to the morality and ethics of the product and the company for whatever that's worth you have peace of mind there's no deception and everything is as you see it if you have experience with a minis forum pc and you want to share it with us let people know what your experience is we'd love to hear from actual owners a lot of people have anxiety you know if i spend a few hundred bucks on a mini pc is it gonna do this or is it gonna do that well i can tell you and you may not believe me you might think i'm biased so when you share your experiences with whatever products, good or bad, I think that helps the viewers who might find you more relatable than me in making their decision. If you, you know, want to share that with other people, you're welcome to do so here. And my thanks, of course, to Minis Forum and to Mara for all the work she's done with the channel and the thumbnails and the video notes and the chat moderation. Thank you, of course. And thanks to all of you and all the membership renewals and contributions during today's show. Enjoy the rest of your Friday. I will see you all again very, very soon. We always have a members only video on Mondays. So for the members, I will see you on Monday. I don't know if I've got any content coming out this weekend, depending on availability, but I do have a lot of content to make. So hopefully I'll find some time here to get caught up. But at the very least, for the members, I will definitely see you Monday at one o'clock. For the rest of you, thank you again for joining. I hope to see you very, very soon. And until next time, Bye for now. Also, um, remember, we have all the links for everything I've talked about in the video notes below the video. Okay, that'll wrap it up. And I'm trying to find an outro. There we go. Bye for now.